Are African countries staying ahead of the coronavirus? The continent has some of the world's lowest infection and death rates. But are we getting the full picture of what's really happening? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. When COVID-19 started to spread around the world, aid workers warned of disaster for Africa, fearing for weak and poorly funded health systems in many places and crowded cities making social distancing impossible. But African countries appear to be managing. Data from Johns Hopkins University shows relatively few cases in sub-Saharan Africa compared to the hotspots in the United States, Europe and Latin America. Just under 4,000 African deaths so far and 130,000 infections. Senegal has one of the world's highest recovery rates. Researchers there are trialling a testing kit that can return a result in 10 minutes and costs just under a dollar. In Ghana, the World Health Organization is looking into an approach called pool testing. Health workers analysed multiple blood samples and conducted individual tests only if they find a positive result. South Africa has the continent's highest number of infections. A tough lockdown has slowed the spread of the disease. But many poor South Africans have lost their jobs. In Tanzania, opposition politicians accuse the government of downplaying the outbreak. Social media videos show people in protective suits burying corona victims at night. Scientists say they're not getting a full picture across the continent because of low testing rates. The World Health Organization predicts nearly a quarter of a billion Africans will be infected over the next year. The actual number of deaths are not as high, which suggests to me that we have actually kind of dodged the bullet, but we're not out of the woods yet. Because if you look at uh, a country like uh, America, uh, especially New York, when uh, they're about, uh, I think, three, four weeks ahead of us in terms of the curve. But uh, about uh, four or five weeks ago, they didn't seem to have any big problem. Then they had that exponential surge, which we have yet to find here. Let's introduce our guests. In Johannesburg, we have Shabir Madhi, director of the South African Medical Research Council and a member of the South African Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. In Uganda's capital, Kampala, Dr. Olive Kobusing, fellow at the George Institute for Global Health. And in Yaounde in Cameroon, Yap Boom, regional representative of Epicenter Africa, the research branch of Doctors Without Borders. Welcome to you all. I'll start with you, uh, Shabir. Has the spread of coronavirus been contained or just delayed in Africa? Well, I think it's a combination of two things. It's probably been delayed compared to what has happened in the Northern Hemisphere. But more importantly, as you alluded to, uh, the testing rate in Africa is amongst the lowest in the world. So the country with the highest testing rate, except outside of besides Mauritius, right now is South Africa, where the testing rate is about 10 per thousand of the population. In other African countries, as an example, in Nigeria, the testing rate is 0 0,2 per thousand of the population. In contrast, in many high-income countries, the testing rate is about at least 10 to 15 times higher than what it is in South Africa. So it's really difficult to sort of make any sort of meaningful analysis in terms of the number of cases there really are in Africa. The type of reports that we see are based on cases that have been investigated. And obviously, in the absence of actually investigating, you're simply not going to report anything. So all of the data that's coming out, including South Africa, really underrepresents the magnitude of COVID-19 in Africa, including both number of cases, as well as in terms of the number of deaths. But at the same time, I think we are, we are relatively at an early stage in terms of the outbreaks in Africa compared to where the Northern Hemisphere are currently over two weeks ago. Olive, where you are in, in East Africa, are the rest of us missing something? Is the worst yet to come or uh, has it been successfully contained? So in East Africa, I think um, a number of things are happening. So there's certainly been a delay. Uh, the result of uh, serious lockdowns, uh, even before we saw any cases in the country, for instance, in Uganda, 
We, we instituted, uh, we closed schools, large gatherings, places of worship. And a day after the first case uh, came into the country, we closed the international airport. There have been serious controls at all borders. So there's been um, a lot of effort spent on making sure that the virus doesn't get into the community. So there is virtually no community transmission. But then it's a result of, again, the serious lockdown. There's, there's been no public transport, no private transportation. There's a curfew uh, beginning at 7 p.m. and ending at 6.30. So even if there might be a virus, it's certainly being given very little opportunity to move about. So I think the real test is going to be once we lift those lockdowns okay. and we begin to have community transmission. In West Africa, generally, there seem to be infection rates are generally higher than in, in Eastern and Southern Africa. How is it? Is it being successfully contained there? What do you think? It's always interesting to figure out the diversity among countries because if you take, even in West Africa, you have Nigeria, Ghana was very high number of, of cases as we are going right now. But you have also country like Togo where the, the number of cases is definitely less than, than a thousand. So what is happening first depends on the dynamic in the, in the country, the mobility, the number of cases that has been imported. And then you will have those countries that are, were quite exposed. Though they have taken quite a number of measures in, in the beginning, since right now we are seeing a, a, an increase. But what we see currently in Cameroon, for example, where there have been some measure to lift the lockdown, we can see that since the, the, the 1st of May, almost the number of cases has gone as double since then. So depending on the country and even within the country, you will see a diversity in, in how the pandemic is going on. So we cannot say that it's been contained. We have to be prudent and to see how the, the figure are going on. Shabir, across Africa, there have been lockdowns to varying degrees of severity. You've had a very severe one in South Africa. But is that lockdown only de delaying the inevitable, do you think? Are you going to see a, an explosion of cases as that lockdown is uh, reduced? Yeah, so I think it's very important to understand the objectives behind a lockdown. The reason why South Africa and many other African countries went into a lockdown is very different from the reason why the United States and many European countries went into the lockdown. It was sort of an opportunity to try to contain the spread of the virus. And for many countries, most countries, including South Africa, unfortunately, that wasn't successful. But it did reduce the rate of transmission of the virus for a period of time which allows healthcare facilities to better to become better equipped in terms of dealing with what is going to be the, in event, in the, event, the in eventual surge in terms of number of cases. So that is going to happen. The lockdown has really sort of moved that a few weeks into the future rather than immediately and OEMs allowed healthcare facilities to, be, to become better equipped. But the major problem in terms of implementation of lockdowns in Africa is that the most important part of a lockdown at that early stage, if you're wanting to contain the spread of the virus, it's dependent on your ability to test at scale, to identify the infectious cases at an early stage, to trace a context, to put a context into quarantine. Even in South Africa, unfortunately, that strategy wasn't in place at the time when the lockdown was implemented, and in other African countries, even less so than in South Africa. So what we saw happen in South Africa as an example over the five-week period of the lockdown is that in the first two weeks of the lockdown, the average number of cases was 30 to 40. But the number of tests that were done in the first two weeks of the lockdown was actually less than the number of tests that were being done before the lockdown. In the last week of the lockdown, the number of the cases each day increased to an average of 400. And the reason why it increased to 400 is that there was a tenfold increase in terms of the amount of testing that was done. Now, the biggest challenge that Africa faces is that we do not have the capability and capacity to do testing the way it should be done to be able to control, identify hotspots and control the rate of transmission of the virus. And that is a major okay. challenge, okay. including, unfortunately, one of the most resourced countries, which is South Africa. OK. Oliver, I see you nodding away there. Do you recognise similarities with how the lockdown went and the effect of it uh, uh, in Uganda? Yes, certainly. Uh, there's been a challenge with securing enough test kits, so that's um, a, a serious limitation. And indeed, we, the, the expectation was that during the lockdown, 
um, that we boost our healthcare system, that we put in place uh, all of what it takes for health workers to, to be able to will be sufficiently protected, but also uh, to have sufficient numbers of test kits, field workers that would do the contact tracing, testing, isolation, quarantining, and all of what goes into containing the infection. Um, the indications are that we, we are coming to uh, uh, somewhat relaxing the lockdowns and maybe lifting uh, some elements of the lockdown. And I'm not entirely sure uh, that the ministry's admission is that we are behind on, te on test kits. Um, and I think uh, the other point about the lockdown is that while the, um, the intention was to reduce people movement, uh, in many areas where people uh, ordinarily live hand to mouth, they were not able to stay in their homes. And in fact, um, the instruction to stay home and stay safe was unrealistic, that people really needed to get out of their homes and, and look for food and, and be able to survive the lockdown. So the lockdowns in certain areas have not been as, uh, as effective as they could have been. OK, and Yap, we've heard uh, from some African countries how effective tracing has been, tracking and tracing, because you've had to do it before for previous outbreaks. Has that been effective in Cameroon, the, tra the tracking? Yeah. The, the tracking have been quite um, impressive, especially during the first the first case that we were having in Yaoundé, in the capital city. But let me just come back to the lockdown, because Cameroon is quite particular in the way that we have not followed the lockdown the way other people, other countries are, has been implementing. So what we did actually was to close the bar and restaurant after 6 p.m. and to reduce the number of people in the public transport. So which means people were still able to move between cities. And that's why, as compared to what you will see in other countries like Ivory Coast, even Uganda and so on, where you have a centralized number of cases in the capital city, in Cameroon, we have the cases in the 10 regions of the country with the highest number in the center where we have, where I'm currently in Yaoundé, in Douala, but also in the west, western region. So which means that at that point, the virus has the time to go within the community, which makes very hard the contact tracing. Because when you have you are in the beginning of the outbreak and you are able to follow, let's say, 20 to 50 contact per patient, that's still feasible. But when you reach a certain number, or let's say 5,000 cases, and each one may have two, uh, 100, 100 the contact, then it's become much more difficult, which pushes us now to think about what is the next strategy. Are we going to continue on contact tracing or are we going to do mass active uh, screening in the community? So that's where we are currently. OK, Shabir, I see you nodding away there. We'll come back to you in a second, but we'll just take a, a short pause because earlier we mentioned how Senegal is tackling the coronavirus. Our correspondent, Nicholas Hack, went to take a closer look last month. Senegal is doing what most countries can't, testing everyone, symptoms or not, entering a health centre for the novel coronavirus. It has no shortage of testing kit thanks to this lab at the Institut Pasteur. Researchers are developing a $1 quick diagnostic kit originally made to test for dengue fever. Patients drop blood or saliva onto the devices and wait for a bloodline to appear, like a pregnancy test, explains researcher Amadou Sal. There is no need for a highly equipped lab. It's a simple test that can be done anywhere. The idea is to rapidly produce two to four million kits, not just for us, but for African countries, so that we can detect and isolate patients quickly. With only 50 ventilator machines for 16 million people, Senegalese engineers are using a 3D printing machine to produce more. While imported ventilators cost $16,000, this one is just $60. Coronavirus is one of many deadly infections the country is dealing with. Lessons learned from the AIDS epidemic, the recent Ebola outbreak, were key in Senegal's strategy in dealing with the pandemic. Now, Shabir, when all this started, your initial modelling said 120,000 people would die in South Africa because of COVID-19. That was based on data from China. Then you revised it down to 45,000. You've had 577 deaths so far. So there seems an awful lot of deaths to come. Are we, are we being too pessimistic? 
Yeah, so just to correct, that wasn't my models. It was models that were done in South Africa by other okay. groups. And initially, the estimate was anything between 80,000 to 350,000 South Africans that would die because of COVID-19. And those figures more recently have been sort of uh, turned, moved downwards to the estimate of between 40,000 and 75,000. Uh-huh. Now, the reality is we really don't know. So the WHO as an example estimates that for the whole of Africa is between 100, 190 and 300,000 people that might die from COVID-19. South Africa makes up less than 5% of the African population. So it's very unlikely that we're going to be contributing to about a quarter of all of those deaths. So the answer is we really don't know. And we need to be cautious in terms of what this modeling tells us. And because there's a lot of assumptions that are made, which might not necessarily be applicable to the African context. South Africa, as you mentioned, in terms of the number of deaths, is still just under 1,000. Do we expect a huge uh, increase? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes. But the other important thing that we need to really start internalizing is that when we talk of 40,000 or 75,000 people dying, those deaths are not going to necessarily take place over a single wave of the epidemic. There's probably going to be multiple waves, which will probably continue right into 2021 and 2022. And there are going to be accumulated number of deaths that are going to take place over a period of time. And that's also important when governments think about how to actually strategize around their response. Because this is not a strategy that you're developing for two to three months or three to five months. COVID-19 is not going to go away at the end of 2020. It's going to be with us with multiple waves. And I think most scientists have now come to agree that irrespective of whether you're in a high-income country, a low-income country, this is an agenda that you need to plan for for the next two years at least. Okay, Olive, you've written about the $666 million that the Ugandan government borrowed from the European Union to go towards fighting coronavirus and then the corruption that happened with that money. You're suggesting that Uganda's kept a lid on the coronavirus by accident rather than design. Is that the case? That could very well be true. And I fear that if, for whatever reason, uh, the deaths that were expected don't happen we could very we could easily have you know some chest thumping and a sense that we've done way better than some countries that have more robust healthcare systems when in fact uh so far what we've seen is very mild cases or asymptomatic uh people that are testing positive so i think that uh there needs to be some some candid discussion around what exactly is it that we've done for there to be this zero number of uh, of deaths for coronavirus. The other disturbing thing is that I think we can be way more fo- too focused on um, the deaths that are a direct result of the virus and forget that every day that passes, hundreds of Ugandans are dying of all manner of illnesses, some of which could have been some of which deaths could have been prevented if we didn't have lockdowns. So I think we need to look both at the deaths that are happening as a result of the virus, direct result and infection, or deaths that are happening because, in fact, we've instituted a serious lockdown on a population that was not prepared at all for the lockdown. And the government has done very little to support that population through this extreme lockdown. Uh, Yeah, Olive has a point there, doesn't she? I mean, Africa, you have... TB deaths, HIV deaths, deaths from malaria and dysentery killing millions of people a year across the continent. Are the lockdowns doing more harm than good? Are they hiding uh, other deaths from other illnesses and diseases? Definitely, when you actually put all your resources, whether human resources, material resources, on fighting against COVID, it will definitely have an, an impact on the other disease. Currently, the, there is a, an outbreak of, of cholera in Cameroon. You have measles, malnutrition in Chad. And all those diseases will lead to an increased number of, of death of, of children because they are less resourced to go and, and track those, those patients. But something that is important to note is who are the people who are dying? When we look at the data that we have from Cameroon or from RDC, most of the people who are dying are those with comorbidity. And when you look at the confirmed cases in those two countries, in DRC, we are around 8% of the confirmed cases who have comorbidities, 16% in Cameroon, as compared to 25% in China. So that can also explain why you will have more death in, in those countries as compared to Africa, because we also know that among the people who have comorbidity, let's say 12% of them will die, as compared to 2% with 
people without com- comorbidity. So knowing more the, the population who are the more at risk, I mentioned the comorbidities, but also those uh, with older age, it's also important in terms of strategy. Okay. So while we have been talking about locking down the entire population, maybe something that we might want to do is to actually focus on the more at risk people. How can we make sure that our elders, those with comorbidity, we prevent them from connecting to other while to stop the transmission of the disease, we can implement what has been done in Cameroon with the uh, the, the mandatory wearing of masks. Okay. That is something critical. All right. Yeah. Uh, Shabir, is there anything to the argument we sometimes hear that people in living in Africa might have better resistance to the novel virus because they have immune systems that are already fighting off various other illnesses? You don't you don't seem to agree with that uh, view. No, uh, certainly not. I think that's a very simplistic sort of. Uh, thinking in terms of why uh, we're not seeing as many cases as we should be seeing in uh, Africa. Like I said, much of it is underpinned by the large absence of testing almost, Mm -hmm. in addition to which we are at different stages in terms of the outbreak in Africa compared to the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, And I think the experience from this goes back to 2009 with swine flu as an example. The fewest number of cases during the swine flu pandemic, the fewest number of cases that were reported were actually from Africa and South Asia. Yet, at the end of the pandemic, when they did analysis in terms of excess of mortality, they found that more than 52% of the deaths that occurred because of swine flu in that one year actually occurred in Africa and South Asia. So these deaths essentially were not being diagnosed because there isn't testing capability and capacity. So we really need to be cautious in terms of how we go about interpreting it. In In fact, in terms of comorbidities, Africa is probably worse off than many countries in Europe. So Europe has got a higher percentage of the population that uh, over the age of 65, as as an example, who are important role players in terms of developing severe disease and dying. But the prevalence of things such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, in South Africa, as an example, makes it an extremely high-risk country in terms of severe disease and mortality. Uh, And then we sort of talked about indirect effects. All of it's completely correct. In fact, at the end of the day, what we're going to see happen in Africa is that a total mortality because of the indirect effect of COVID in terms of the response to COVID with sort of unmeasured strategies with lockdowns, etc., is going to be much, much greater than the direct effect of COVID. UNICEF estimates that in the low middle income countries, there's going to be between 250,000 and 1.2 million children that are going to die. Not because of COVID. Children rarely develop severe disease from COVID. They're going to die because they've been denied or they're not getting access to essential healthcare services. And that is something countries need to start understanding. In South Africa, during the five weeks of the lockdown, we had a 50% decrease in terms of the number of individuals that came forward for testing for tuberculosis. South Africa has got one of the highest incidence of tuberculosis in the world. What does it mean? The lockdown didn't cure TB. It means that the diagnosis of tuberculosis is being delayed. It means that those people are more infectious in the community infecting others. And it means they're going to have a poorer outcome because they're delayed in terms of treatment initiation. So there's a lot of things that we're not thinking about whilst all of the attention is focused around COVID-19. Olive, we've just got time for a very quick answer uh, for a global audience. As As Professor Shabir has warned, Uh, coronavirus is not going to go away quickly. Are there any aspects of our lives that can go back to how they were or what will have to change forevermore, the way we live? So uh, there's one one thing we could walk away with that is very positive, and that's that we've made a big effort to improve our sanitation. You know, the repeated calls for for hand washing. There have been large... um, Uh, chunks of our population that didn't have any hand washing facilities that are going to now have um, a focus on water and soap. And so I would hope that that's one thing that's going to change. Um, The other thing that I I hope we can walk away with and and carry with us even as the pandemic progresses is that we we actually invest in building more robust healthcare systems. Because currently, a lot of people have no access to uh, emergency medical services, no referral system. If they go into labor in the middle of the night during a curfew, that's a death sentence. And I think we need to change that. So what are we going to stay with? I think more robust, we need to invest in more robust healthcare systems. What are we going to leave behind? I think the thought that people need to fend for themselves and that 
uh, somehow we can scrape through these kinds of crises because we really can't and a lot of people are going to come to harm, are going to die as a result of the okay. poor preparedness. All right. Folks, we're out of time, unfortunately, but thank you very much to all of our guests, Shabir Madhi, Olive Kubba Singh and Yap Boom. Thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story and I am at Jazeera Bernard. From me, Bernard Smith, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.